of the conference. Uh, now it's time to move on to our very first uh, session, uh, which will be the keynote speech that will be given by Professor Derek Bunn. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm a pleasure to introduce you to Professor Bunn. I'm super thrilled, honestly, uh, to, to, uh, to, to have this honor, because Derek, uh, on a personal note, is uh, one of the few academics who convinced me to opt out from uh, industry and go uh, in, in academia. So uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor for you to have you here today. And I must confess that I'm a bit under stress because uh, watching Steve and Derek on the same stage reminds me of de the defense of my dissertation. So the last time I met them, I was a bit under pressure, you know, to defend my, my, my manuscript. And I hope they will not ask me to, uh, some errors that I've been um, point some errors that have been made. So, but it's time to move on to, to present Derek. So Professor Derek Byrne is a professor at uh, London Business School, where he is a professor of decision science. He has led the department there. But more importantly, he's a prolific researcher, having also more than 200 papers, uh, 200 articles in a, in a diverse set of areas, including forecasting, time series econometrics, decision analysis, and of course, energy economics. And uh, over the years, he has built an expertise in energy economics, having had the opportunity to work on the restructuring of the UK market, the restructuring of the CEGB, having worked uh, and, con and uh, provided consultancy and advice to government officials, uh, of course in the UK, in some country, but also abroad in Korea and other countries. Um, and so I think that he, he brings in to us a, a wealth of experience uh, that is uh, v extremely valuable when understanding how the industry is changing and how we as academics can have a, an opportunity to orient or to provide policy relevant research that can be useful for, for policy makers. Um, during his career, he was, I should have said that uh, before going to economics, uh, he, he was read in natural science at uh, Cambridge, if I do remember correctly, uh, and then having had a, a PhD at London Business School. So, pr Professor Derek Burns, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you very much, Olivia. That, that's a very kind introduction. And I have to say, I have very good memories of your defense. And, uh, and there, there are no outstanding questions or revisions that <laughs> need to be dealt with. So, um, yeah, I'm b basically I want to give a rather um, practical survey of some of the work I've been doing for about the last six years uh, on capacity auctions. Um, I, I'm part of the, the, um, the, the panel that sets the capacity auction parameters in, in the UK. Uh, and, I'm, and so I've been, I've been involved in that process for, for, for quite a while. Uh, and, and what I'm really going to kind of give a sense this morning of is, is in a sense, my, my discomfort with the whole process. Um, it's a very kind of model intense a activity. And I would say it's kind of um, deceptively precise. And so, so I, I just want to kind of, if you like, share my, my, my discomfort with some of the, the imprecisions. So, I mean, I, I think most of you are aware of what, what capacity payments are. In, in, in the electricity market context. It's essentially, they are uh, supplements for, for um, the generators to actually provide uh, a, a revenue stream associated with the, the capacity they bring to the system over and above what they might earn from trading in the, the, um, the, the wholesale markets. Um, and from a theoretical point of view, that, that's been con controversial right since the beginning. I mean, for over 30 years, people have debated whether you need capacity payments or not, or whether the, the, um, the scarcity payments in, in the energy markets would be sufficient. I, I really don't want to get involved in that theoretical discussion today, um, but we can talk about it later if, if some of you want to. And papers are appearing all the time. A recent paper in the very last issue of the Energy Journal is on that same topic once again. Um, I mean, the reality is that, that they, they do seem to be becoming more popular. Um, and part of that is because of the energy transition with, with the kind of the rapid change towards renewables, uh, the, the, um, the, the kind of um, value destruction for uh, incumbent fossil fuel generators has been quite substantial. Uh, the load factors of, of uh, incumbent generators declined rapidly in the last 12 years or so. Uh, and that prompted an, a, a concern about giving those generators extra 
revenue streams through capacity payments just to be available in the system. Um, interestingly, here in Europe, um, th you know, there has been an evolution of sentiment towards it. Initially, uh, ENSOE and the, the European Union, uh, the, uh, the group of uh, European energy regulators, didn't like the idea. It was seen as state aid. Uh, it was seen um, uh, as unnecessary subsidies. Then pragmatism started to develop, uh, and they were accepted on a case-by-case -case basis, but with the proviso that they should be temporary. And now that kind of sentiment has switched more towards creating harmonization, standards for risk simulation, and indeed proposals for um, more efficient cross-border arrangements. So, so there's been a gradual accommodation, if you like, to the pragmatism that, that these things seem to be needed. And of course, more recently, the last year or so, uh, geopolitics has raised the whole issue of energy independence again for, for um, countries, and that gets conflated with the whole idea of providing for resource adequacy through with capacity payments. Uh, in, in terms of, of mechanisms, uh, the, the, the prevalent approach these days seems to be towards uh, auctions uh, for providing generators with a, a revenue stream uh, based on their um, uh, capacity. Uh, how those auctions work, obviously, is idiosyncratic to particular jurisdictions, and it does change from one place to another. Uh, sometimes they take the form of a straight payment uh, determined through an auction. Sometimes they're expressed in terms of what's known as reliability options, which is a kind of a, a one-way contract for difference, but essentially it provides a similar kind of, of stream. Um, usually they're centrally procured. Um, there are alternatives around, uh, one of which um, uh, is in France and, and notably another one in California where the obligation is put more on the retailers to, to actually contract forward. Um, but, but the whole idea of, of an ensuring adequate capacity re remuneration, in the general sense, uh, it is common to all of them. Uh, uh, e even some jurisdictions where there is an attempt to create what's known as a strategic reserve, which is where uh, a certain amount of capacity is actually taken out of the market and the idea is that it won't, it won't actually interfere with the normal working of the wholesale market, but it will be held uh, and paid for as, as an emergency reserve. Uh, those tend to develop as a kind of uh, expediency uh, in, in countries where there's been kind of rapid change. For example, in Germany, where the, um, the nuclear uh, retirement was going out rather quickly, the distressed um, gas turbine assets were and some of the very new distressed gas turnover habits were, 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 were given some, some uh, payments to kind of not, not be decommissioned, but to stay there in case it's necessary. Um, I mean, the, the people have always looked to the, to the US for, for some guidelines on capacity payments, and they've been around for a long time, particularly in the Northeast states. Um, and here is um, some, some uh, data from the New England ISO. Uh, I, mean, I want to make two points about it, about this. I mean, the, the payments are, are, are quite substantial. So even during this period, which, which was 10 years ago or more, uh, the, the capacity payments on top of the energy um, revenue streams through, through the, um, the ISO, I mean, they, they look small, but the, but the point is that the capacity payments are kind of free money. They're on top of everything else. And, and here you would actually have uh, quite tightly regulated returns uh, in the energy market. So the profit contribution might be quite small here because the, you know, the, the cost of gas or coal w would be a substantial part of that. So they, they have been important. And, and the way to judge their importance is to kind of look at the, the statements that companies make to, in their investor relations uh, engagement. Uh, and, they, and they invariably stress the value that capacity payments have towards reassuring investors that the company uh, uh, is doing well. Um, and in paradox, um, uh, either the, 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 the absence of capacity payments uh, can be an excuse for, for, uh, for some of the statements that uh, are made uh, uh, to, to investors. So um, more recently, after the 
after um, uh, the, the, the early years of the, the energy transition. Uh, a couple of statements here. For example, um, Scottish and Southern Electric made this announcement to its investors that it would not be closing one of the, the gas-fired plants that, that was becoming distressed and low load factor because of the energy transition, because of a lot of wind uh, coming in. It would not be closing because the capacity markets were going to offer it more money. On the other hand, another large company, uh, a large um, a thermal generating company, uh, said it's going to develop four new gas-fired power stations, but they would only go ahead if they could secure attractive capacity payments. In Ireland, uh, there's been a capacity market for a while. Uh, Viridian, uh, which operates in the Dublin area, um, was only successful with one of its two plants uh, in the capacity auction, uh, and it got upset about that. And it immediately said, I I'm going to walk away. I'm not going to play anymore. Uh, of course, the regulator didn't like that, uh, and basically created an ad hoc capacity payment for that, that generator outside the market. So these, these, these things are, are really quite important. Ratings agents, you know, the, the rating agencies, the, they like these things as well. Um, Moody's, around about that same time, downgrades EDF to... Um, still a good rating but not a top rating uh, and they say this outlook could be returned if clarity develops on the capacity payments so the ratings agencies look at this very carefully uh, again in Ireland um, they were the Moody's were quite pleased that ESB was, was doing quite well Viridian again I've talked about uh, S&P also look at it uh, and on the Irish case uh, that they were rather positive towards ESB, that you know they were doing well because, or partly because of capacity payments. And I like this phrase, quasi-regulated regulatory support. I'm not really quite sure what that means, but um, it, it obviously had some value to S and P. Um, I mean, the, the idea uh, of, of the the auction process for doing this is is remarkably simple at a high level. Um, the, uh, the system operator or the government or the, whoever is providing the kind of the, the central purchasing of this determines a volume that needs, needs to be in the system to provide uh, adequate uh, resource. Uh, that volume uh, it is actually put up for auction. Um, all qualifying facilities take part in the auction. The auction tends to look between one and four years ahead, usually. Um, those that are successful in the auction uh, get these capacity awards, which would be uh, fixed payments based, pure, based purely upon the amount of capacity that they've got. Um, and they could be for one year for existing facilities, or they could go up to 15 years, perhaps, for, for new build. Um, uh, the idea is that there should be some secondary trading after the, the auction closes between the award and the delivery. Um, these markets tend to be very liquid and very little secondary trading actually takes place. But it was an important ingredient to actually ensure uh, a kind of efficient exit and transfer if some of these capacity uh, holders want to change their, their operations for whatever reason. Then, in return, if the system is under stress at any point in time, and to be under stress means that uh, available supply um, is getting very close to demand or possibly even just a little bit less, all of the capacity holders are expected to be there, and if they're not, if they're not there, they'll pay a penalty. So the, so the deal is, is, is quite straightforward. Um, the, the cost of this obviously gets passed to the consumers uh, through the retailers. And at the high level, uh, the, the, the modeling task is, is relatively straightforward. So, I mean, the, the process is um, ahead of these auctions, if it's 
it's an auction based system uh, if the system operator is running it they're going to project the current expectations for installed capacity so a usual kind of um, waterfall chart where you're looking at what capacity is there what might be re what might be retired or what might be coming in uh, or should be coming in according to plans uh, and and where you expect uh, the capacity to be then there's a lot of Monte Carlo simulation that goes into simulating demand here it's um, uh, summer and winter by modality uh, in Britain and simulating the uncertainty of this supply. So if that's the average, um, then um, there's obviously going to be some uh, uncertainty around that. And, and based upon simulating the distribution uh, of supply, uh, distribution of demand, you can work out the risk that there will be uh, resource inadequacy, that there will not be uh, enough supply to meet demand. So you're, you're worried about the overlap of those two tails. Um, and that overlap is sometimes expressed in terms of the area, expected energy un unserved, or what that means in terms of number of hours a, a year, that loss of load expectation. So that looks straightforward. Um, but any of you that have been worried about the tails of distributions, and particularly looking several years ahead, will know how fragile a, a tail area is to, to estimate. And then, of course, what you're concerned about here is the overlap of two tails. So that, you know, that's more than doubly challenging. So, I mean, straight away, you know that you're dealing with a very um, awkward estimation task, even though, in principle, it looks re relatively straightforward. And of course, the idea is that you're going to try to move this distribution here to the right by essentially trying to acquire more capacity so that that area meets a target. And that target is usually known as the reliability target for that particular jurisdiction. Uh, and so on top of the problem of actually estimating this uh, area, um, setting the target is also extremely uh, fragile. Um, it's sometimes expressed in terms of how many hours per year uh, loss of load you are expecting. And that seems to be the, the, the common way to do it. Uh, in Europe, it seems to be moving towards three hours. And that does seem to be the, the, um, the, the European target. Um, uh, and you ask yourself, where does that three hours come from? And it's a very slippery um, conceptualization, basically. Uh, that there's no hard evidence that three hours is what society in this country or, or Britain or Germany or, or, or any, or, you know, why three hours? And it seems to have been a kind of a convergence of consensus. Um, I mean, there is a theory, uh, and kind of a first order condition would be that the loss of load probability times the value of loss of load should equal the, the marginal new entrant cost. I mean, that, that, that's a fairly understandable first order condition. And you think, well, that, that will give us a basis for it. But the loss of load probability, of course, has to be estimated from a very fragile simulation like that. And then nobody really knows what the value of loss of load is you know, for, a, for a country as a whole. You know, uh, is it the same for different subpopulations of the country? Probably not. If, if the financial district loses an hour of power, it's very, very different from, from a rural area. Um, can it really just be, be one value? Probably not. And then for how long loss of load? Is, is it linear with the amount of time that, that load is being lost? You know, it's, does, does 10 hours effectively have a, a 10 times the societal cost of one hour? Probably not. Um, so, I mean, th this is a horrible number to deal with, um, but people do. There have been some surveys on trying to come up with it. 
uh, and they vary enormously um, uh, and even inconsistently within the same jurisdiction. So, I mean, I give you the, the English example because I'm, I know it quite well, but in, in the wholesale market, uh, like most of Europe, I mean, the, the markets, uh, the, the wholesale markets uh, and balancing markets, that they're capped. And they tend to be around about £6,000 per, per megawatt hour. But the value of loss of load that's used for resource adequacy in these calculations is much higher. Uh, and, the, I mean, the issues around that are, are extremely slippery. And they make a difference. I mean, if you, if you look at the optimal procurement at 6K from the wholesale market or 17K, which is used in, in the resource adequacy calculation, it would lead to a kind of a difference of, of about 1.5 gigawatts of procurement, which if you re-simulated uh, an early auction, uh, w would amount to about a billion pounds in, in social cost. Uh, and, and that's just due to the kind of the inadequacy of being able to estimate the value of loss of load properly. And then, of course, even if you were able to estimate it properly, it turns out that loss of load is not actually loss of load. Um, you know, wh what, do you, what do you really define as inadequacy in the resource? Is it when they start making disconnections? You would think so, but generally speaking, it's not. It's when the, the wholesale markets are inadequately supplied with with the, the capacity. And between that point, where if you like, that there's a shortage in the market clearing mechanism, and the point at which the system operator actually starts to disconnect, there are a lot of things that can happen. Uh, there's a lot of kind of um, reserve services, flexibility services that, that the system operator can call upon, which are usually not put into the equation for, for reserve or resources uh, in the capacity market, but seen as kind of uh, system requirements. Uh, there's a certain amount of voltage reduction that can take place, so called brownouts. Uh, there's o overstressing for a short period of time on the system. Uh, and to the extent that you've got friendly neighbors, they may well be the potential to actually get uh, more than the normal amount of uh, supplies from interconnections. So, so there's a lot going on here. Um, and, and this cr provides quite a bit of buffer for the system operator in this calculation. So even if you thought you could actually cost what the value of loss of load to, to society is, it's not actually the value that, that, that goes into the calculation because you, you're, um, you're not incurring that quite such, in such a, a cliff edge way as you, you would have thought. Um, and then there are all sorts of resources which are really difficult to deal with. Um, uh, greater in interconnection uh, is, is a, a widespread initiative uh, induced mainly by um, the need for security and in particular the need for security as a consequence of a lot of renewable energies coming in. Uh, and the problem with, with wind and solar and weather dependent supply is that it can be a problem locally. So one of the solutions to that is to have a wider interconnection geographically so that there will be uh, some averaging of, of resources uh, due to you know, the weather being different in different locations. Uh, and so here again is the example from UK. Lots of interconnections existing and planned. Um, uh, the, the problem there is, um, I mean, is the interconnector company a resource, or is it part of the transmission network? Uh, and to the extent that they are injecting into a national transition, a transmission network, uh, they're seen as resources. But of course, they're, they're just transmission companies. So they can't really be, be responsible for delivery in the same way that, that a, a facility like an offshore wind farm could be. Nevertheless, they are given capacity payments uh, in the system. Um, but to the extent that they're not in control of the flows of power, they, they're not liable for any penalties. 
So that in itself uh, is a rather kind of con controversial uh, element in the resource uh, allocation there. They, they're given the benefits, even though they're not actually generating, they are transmitting, uh, and they're not responsible for the outcomes. So a lot of concerns around that. Uh, the, the, the direction of travel um, uh, with, with, within the kind of the, the European uh, uh, de deliberations for, for cross-border capacity market participations is to move away from the interconnectors getting revenue and to actually allow individual generators in different countries to participate in the capacity markets of all others. That's going to present a, a wonderfully challenging uh, exercise to actually uh, clear uh, a pan-European capacity market where everyone in every country can actually get uh, capacity uh, credits from every other country. A huge network problem there. Um, on top of this, um, some of these offshore wind farms, the large ones, are now not just connecting to single markets. There's quite a number around here that are connecting with multiple markets. And so you have this kind of evolution of offshore resources that start out essentially as remote generating facilities for a particular country, inevitably morphing towards being interconnection if that wind farm there can trade with with the Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, as well as the UK. A little bit like the gas network uh, in the North Sea as well. Now this is becoming very complicated, but it's uh, but quite crucial. I mean, the, the total around here is something like about 12, 12 gigawatts, so that's, that's an enormous contribution. So we've, we've got uh, offshore facilities becoming uh, interconnectors as well. And also, um, you know, when is an interconnector an interconnector? So here's an interesting project, which is looks like it's going to happen. Uh, it's a very long line from Morocco to to Britain. Um, uh, wonderful resource here of wind and solar, remarkably stable, um, huge resource, 3.6 gigawatts, a nice long cable. It's going to be perfectly reliable, no problems. Um, uh, and the interesting thing is that it's a dedicated connection. So this facility here is not going to be connected to the, the Moroccan grid. And uh, those of us that have worked with kind of, uh, a single European market for a long time will be dismayed that it seems to be a better solution to do all of this than just to kind of come into the European network. Kind of quite remarkable. It seems like a good idea, but then when you start to talk about the, the risks in this, it, it turns out that it, it presents just as many risks as it appears to solve. Because if this huge connection comes in, people start worrying about what would happen if that fails. And like, like any single connection, there would have to be sufficient redundancy in the system to be resilient to the loss of a single connection. That's a normal standard for, for transmission systems. Um, and so you find yourself pondering upon the, the rationality of having such a large resource, which is motivated by resource adequacy and risk considerations, and then having to kind of then do, if you like, a, a second order risk analysis on what happens if this doesn't work. And it's not just for technical reasons, and there's also all sorts of geopolitical uh, concerns as well. So that doesn't make life any easy, even though this looks like a good thing. Now, talking about unreliable resources, I mean, every element uh, in the simulation, every generating unit, uh, has to be uh, probabilistically represented in terms of its reliability. And for conventional units, uh, it's, it's always been relatively straightforward to do that. So whether you're talking about open cycle gas turbine uh, or, um, or um, 
the replacement of coal by biomass or even nuclear, there are reliabilities there. Uh, and those get treated as probabilities and to the extent that the resources are independent, you get a big kind of binomial simulation of the whole thing. The problem is with renewables, with wind, um, and also with storage and in interconnectors, where there isn't as much historical data, and um, how they behave under stress situations will be different from how they behave under normal situations. So you, you can't just look at the, the kind of historical availability. Uh, you have to kind of consider how will these uh, uh, operate when you're in a situation of stress. And that requires you to go into to some quite uh, speculative simulation. Uh, it becomes even more complicated, of course, when you start to think about wind and solar and other weather effects where, where the, you know, the, the same weather conditions affect both the demand and the supply side uh, of, the, of the modeling. Nevertheless, it can be done. It gets even more complicated when you try to bring these into the auction process. So w when you're having an auction, you want all of the facilities to, to offer their capacity into the auction. Uh, the, the auction process will derate each of the capacities which are put in according to their reliability so that you can actually start to in some way compare uh, equivalent firm capacities between the providers and then you have an auction based upon I equivalent firm capacities. Terminology uh, varies around the world, tends to be referred to as, as UCAP uh, in the US. Um, and so you, 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 you then need to start to simulate the equivalent firm capacity of some of these very non-firm resources. And usually what, what's done is to create the simula simulation model that you're doing here for the overall um, uh, reliability of the system. And then you, you take out each of these elements um, one by one and find out each of these stochastic elements, wind, solar, uh, interconnection, uh, storage, one by one, and replace them with a firm amount of capacity to give the same reliability of the system. So the equivalent firm capacity is just, in a sense, what it sounds like, the replacement of a non-firm resource with a firm resource. That sounds like a good idea. Um, and then once you've got this equivalent firm capacity, you can take the, the ratio of that to the installed capacity and you, you get the derating factor. It turns out that you end up with quite low derating factors, as you would expect, for, for some of these resources. Um, and uh, that partly explains why capacity markets, in general, are not sufficient to provide uh, the extra remuneration for these resources, and they usually get um, uh, other subsidy mechanisms uh, instead. But to the extent that those subsidy mechanisms might run out or no longer be applicable, they would be left with something like this. They are tricky. Um, for example, storage. Um, uh, a lot depends upon how you think that storage is going to operate. Is it going to be a resource that um, will provide a substantial amount for a relatively short period, for kind of flexibility balancing purposes, or for four or five hours, or possibly longer? Uh, and the value to the system uh, of storage depends to a certain extent upon how long it can provide that resource for. Same is true of demand side resources as well. Anything that is sort of energy limited, you have to kind of envisage how that will operate and over what period of time. And th th I mean, this is the result of the analysis for, for, for batteries. And you can see that the in short duration batteries are, are now not very useful, um, uh, not so much as long duration. Um, and that's because there are a lot more of these in the system and they're all correlated, so the marginal value of an extra battery resource if there's already a lot is not so much. In the same way that the marginal value of an extra wind resource starts to decline. 
and, and that, that's one of the two problems uh, with the AFCs. Um, for um, wind, solar, storage, interconnectors, the marginal equivalent firm capacity of adding extra one, it, it's not constant, it declines over time. And to the extent that's the basis of the derating factors for those asset owners and what they get in the, the auctions, it's quite hard for them to understand and it needs quite a bit of explanation. And that's because they, 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 there's correlation between those resources. Um, and, and it's quite substantial. If you're looking at offshore wind between next year and four years later, the, the, um, the derating factor uh, is declining substantially. Uh, the other thing about these de uh, equivalent firm capacities in the auction uh, is, is that they, um, they, they don't add up properly. Um, and so if you, if you compute the marginal uh, equivalent firm capacity for each of the interconnectors, say, uh, and you give them their auction um, derating based upon that, and what they earn in the auction is based upon that. It turns out that if they're all successful in the auction, the actual sum of those EFCs does not equal the actual EFC of the total. Um, and so that's a worry um, because you would, you would then end up procuring uh, too much in the auction because you would be underestimating, uh, you know, it would, it would be sub-additive uh, in terms of, of the winning uh, interconnectors. It can be solved uh, using coalition theory and using Shapley values. So looking at all of the interconnectors uh, as a coalition of resources and deciding upon the fair allocation, that, that works. And that's relatively straightforward to do. Uh, and it would make a difference. So here is uh, the equivalent firm capacities worked out in the usual way in amber based upon um, marginals. Here, if you give them their Shapley adjustment, um, that creates too much of a headache for policymakers to compute. They don't, you know, uh, and it's, it, it's a, sadly, uh, despite all of the other computational intensity, uh, it's a little bit too much for them to take. So, I mean, they will essentially just rescale these so that they, they add up. But there are some errors involved depending upon the, the marginal value uh, of, of the different interconnectors. So there's a flaw there as well, which uh, sadly I don't think will get resolved. Um, so, so despite all of this uh, and the amount of time that the system operators put in to, to trying to be precise and doing the best they can, they're still uncomfortable about the whole process. Um, demand side uh, is, is included. In most jurisdictions, it's mandated to be treated on, on the kind of, if you like, a, a, an equivalent non-discriminatory basis with, with um, conventional generation. But system operators don't trust it. So you do tend to see that when they're calling um, resources uh, and flexible resources, they will tend to call a dispatchable unit rather than demand side, even though they're not supposed to. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about batteries. Will they really be fully charged in a stress event when they're needed? Um, interconnectors, a very important part of reliability, but they've never been tested. There have not been enough stress events around, and they've only been tested uh, in simulation models and a lot of speculation as to just how much friction, if you want, want to call it that, there would be uh, when, when those flows actually have to happen. Even for conventional facilities, the historic reliabilities of gas generators, nuclear, um, thermal plants in general, uh, they're not constant over the lifetime, and particularly when, when facilities are, are approaching their end of life, they tend not to be uh, maintained as well, and so their reliability gets worse. Sometimes uh, there's an attempt to include energy efficiency in some capacity markets around the world. Very, very awkward to do, uh, and most, 
most system operators, most policymakers, uh, you know, advocate energy efficiency, but they run away from from trying to include it in the market. And then this kind of lack of liquidity for for trading uh, capacity awards uh, amongst uh, generators. If, for example, they they want to exit a market or they want to um, uh, mothball a plant for a number of, of, of months, uh, the the liquidity there for secondary trading is is uh, it's very low. So all of which ma makes um, the system operators very risk averse in the way in which they they implement this methodo methodology. And the biggest way in which this risk aversion gets manifest. Is, is in the way in which uncertainty is dealt with. And uh, from a risk analysis point of view, um, th this is also quite, um, quite uncomfortable. Um, so we, you've got all of that stochastic simulation I was talking to you about, and the risk simulation based upon reliabilities, derating, and so on. And you've got this target, the three hours uh, loss of load expectation, and you try to kind of find out how much capacity you need to meet that target. The question is, under what general assumptions are you doing that? And so you then find that you, you do this exercise over and over again under different assumptions. So you have a large number of scenarios, each of which gets simulated to provide that, that loss of load expectation under the um, the, the, the availability assumptions for each of the facilities. So you've, you've got the, the actual capacity that, that you would need to get to your three hours LOLE under a wide range of scenarios. And, and then, of course, the question is, what do you do with that? Um, because I mean, you shouldn't be having scenarios if you're doing a full stochastic simulation, but you have to, because a lot of these things put probabilities on there that they are based upon uh, assumptions about uh, policy support, technological innovation, extreme events and, and so on. So w what tends to happen is that for each scenario you work out the optimal amount to procure based upon um, the, the cost of under procurement um, essentially being the, the value of loss of load and the cost of over procurement being the, the marginal uh, cost of, of capacity that you have uh, over procured. And then you actually, uh, in the UK and Ireland, try to do something with all of those. And, and one approach uh, is to use uh, minimax regret. So you look at the, the maximum regret under each of these scenarios, if you procure the optimal, and so you have a regret function, and you choose basically the procurement that gives you the minimum regret across all of the scenarios. Well, those of you that have spent any time looking at decision theory know that minimax regret is not a good criterion. Um, nevertheless, uh, it, it seems to, to be useful here uh, to the extent that it gives uh, a way of, of resolving this dilemma of, of, of kind of optimal procurements under um, different assumptions. Uh, it, it would work to an extent if you thought these scenarios were in some way complete and representative and equally plausible, but of course they're not. And so Despite all of this, after all of this modeling, the, the kind of the recommendations usually go to a, 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 a kind of a policy determination at a fairly high level. Uh, and in the United Kingdom, it's, it's at ministerial level. And then there's a huge political decision on top of everything. Um, results. Um, so the auctions work. Generally speaking, the government is sort of happy with the, uh, the auctions, a demand function, a declining auction, market clears. Um, uh, 
more recently, uh, a lot of concern about security, uh, high procurement, high price, very high price. Um, the the uh, new entrant cost is much less than that. Um, and um, uh, I mean, one of the the concerns about capacity markets is whether they should be technologically neutral and should you have separate auctions for different technologies, particularly separate auctions for, for green technologies. Um, problem, problem there is that a lot of the renewable technologies get supported by other means, feed-in tariffs or, or contracts for differences and so on. Uh, th and also, I mean, things are changing. So, I mean, when a lot of these markets were developed, they, they were kind of developed with, with a framework of trying to keep uh, existing thermal plant on the system a little bit longer than they might otherwise be um, because they were not getting the, the, the returns in the wholesale market and to provide the security. Possibly uh, to provide so for some marginal new build as well. Um, in the short term, uh, they were largely meant to provide uh, a year-by-year -year, uh, extension. In the longer term, a signal perhaps for extra resources when they're needed. The, the, the sort of technology mix which is now coming into electricity market is very different from what was in the mind of people when they, they designed these capacity payment schemes. And the future of renewables, storage, um, possibly carbon capture and storage, possibly nuclear, but very different mix from, from what has been around and probably the, the design of a relatively short term capacity market is too short term to provide any support for, for, for those kind of things. So um, not really fit for purpose in the longer term considering the kinds of, of technologies coming in. Working for storage, of course, in terms of batteries, but perhaps not long-term storage in terms of, of a kind of a, a hydrogen or methane economy. Longer-term storage um, uh, is presenting uh, a huge issue to, to security. Uh, there is increasing concern about medium-term resource adequacy 10 years out, not reflected uh, in these these kind of capacity payment schemes at all, um, and the, the transition that will be needed uh, to provide the security 10 years out is huge, not least because the, the kind of the dynamics of weather risk uh, will be, be much more um, crucial in, in terms of, pr of, of the requirements, if you like, for um, low low risk but high duration weather events. You know, if there's a large dependency upon wind and solar, it's possible under certain weather circumstances with weather patterns coming in that the stress events will not be of the, of the, of the few hours, but they could be of, of a week or so. Um, and it turns out that the most of the analysis which has been done suggests that even huge assemblies of, 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 of lithium-ion batteries would not provide that kind of, of reassurance. Hence, there's a lot of interest in long-term storage, and people are talking, talking about hydrogen uh, in, in this case. Also, it means that the indicative longer-term planning is coming back, even in jurisdictions which have tended to feel that, that with a well-functioning competitive market, the market should actually respond uh, to the signals. Uh, so my final slide, my final slide. Um, so this is very complicated modeling. Um, it, as I said, it looks deceptively analytical, but the, you know, the, the devil is in the details. As you go through each element, you know, you've, you've got very fragile, si fragile simulation trying to compute the overlap of two tail areas, which are very, very slippery to estimate. And furthermore, you don't really know what you should be, be determining as, a, as, the, as a target. 
um, the, the reliabilities of the new facilities, very awkward to estimate. And then what do you do with the distinction between the, um, the uncertainties that you can measure and the uncertainties that you can't measure? And you know, as, as in a, a lot of public um, planning, uh, this what you might call a pathology of attention displacement. We spend a lot of time modeling what we can model, but actually what we can't model is where the bigger problems are. Um, and uh, you know, we, we, this, is, this has been very evident in, in the last 18 months, you know, when, when the European gas supply crisis hit um, 18 months ago, governments procured as much as possible. And so, you know, when stress events really happen, they induce a lot of activity. Um, you know, in risk analysis, you look at, the, at stress events and you, you look at them quite calmly and you, you do the analysis uh, in the way in which um, I, I was indicating. Um, but when it actually happens, behavior um, panics. Um, and, you know, how do you take geopolitical risk into something like this? Uh, how do you take large-scale, common-mode uh, risk? You know, when, when you've got a, a, a fleet of nuclear plants and you find a fault, you tend to look at all of the other nuclears of the same generation, and you might shut them down as well, because you, you found a fault in one of them and you think this might be system systematic. You know, and that, 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 you know, that's an issue here in this country. And also, um, corporate risks, you know, when, when plants uh, are owned uh, as a portfolio uh, and a company gets into distress, it might shut down several plants. Um, uh, at what point should a government step in and actually use those plants, uh, uh, and they probably would not be usable in the short term. We've had that situation uh, in Britain. Um, three large CCGTs uh, went, off, went off the system a couple of years ago because the company that held them went into distress. Uh, they were off the system for a while. They're good plants, they could come back, but they're not in a fit state to come back. Um, so. So there's a lot of issues there. So I just, I just leave with, with this open question. I, I, mean, I, I said that this was a talk about discomfort, uh, discomfort with modeling, um, the, the, the way in which this modeling in, is done. I mean, I think the case study I've done from, from Britain is, is, is comparable to the way in which resource allocation gets done uh, in many jurisdictions. Um, and, you know, it's deceptively analytical, I would say. Uh, and when it comes down to it, I think you would say it's not really fit for purpose because um, you don't deal with, with the, the, the bigger risks. And if you like, where is diversity coming into this analysis? You know, where, where is contingency planning coming into this analysis? I, I think there are a lot of open questions there. So with those thoughts, I, I, I will stop talking. Thank you. But thank you. I mean, that's 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 a very kind of g general question in a way. Winners and losers. Um, I mean, uh, up until recently, I would have said that that the the system uh, uh, tends to over procure uh, and it's costing too much. I th I think 
uh, each of those stages of analysis have rounding errors, have elements of risk aversion, and they compound. Um, and so uh, the idea that you are planning for, say, three hours, uh, in reality, no politician wants to actually accept that three hours is the risk. And uh, the, the, the story in Britain is that we've been doing this now for about eight years trying to, to, to model three hours, and the outturn has been far less, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of an hour, you know, it, it, over procurement. And, and in particular, that Minimax regret shows that that's a lot of risk aversion comes into that. So I would have said that we were over procuring. But then, of course, everyone was scared, you know, in you know, in April last year, wh when there was a huge gas shortage. And people were then kind of saying, we haven't done enough to have our own energy independence, we're not resource adequate, and so on. So, <laughs> what do you prepare for? I think, I think that ultimately is the answer. Uh, and that, that, that is a slippery question. I, I, I think, I think, Contingency planning should probably become more transparent. You know, if this happens, this is what we do. If this happens, this is, uh, and then a discussion around what are contingencies that are affordable and what are not. I don't think I've answered your question completely, but I mean, that's kind of kind of my feeling on that. probably indicate what I think. Um, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I think that the, 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 the open questions uh, are around some kind of major commitments to different kinds of technologies for solving the longer term uh, resource adequacy. And uh, there, I think the issue is that we're, we're concerned about um, outages that will last for a long period of time. I, I don't think we're talking about geopolitics here. I, I just think that we're, we're talking about a situation where there is a lot of, of, of weather-dependent resources in the system, and when weather systems come in, they, you know, they, they can create problems, not just for a few hours, but for, 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 for many days. Uh, and Countries with a lot of hydro, uh, I think, are, are, to a certain extent, are fine with that. But if there's not a lot of, of, of hydro, then uh, we're talking about a new economy having to come through. And most people are talking there about, about possibly hydrogen, or possi which would be green, perhaps, or, um, or possibly blue hydrogen uh, and methane. Uh, and, I, and I think the hydrogen economy gets mixed up with industrial policy as well. And there's a lot of feeling that, that you can only kind of bring a hydrogen economy in if you bring it into industrial clusters in the first instance uh, and probably link it to, to some of the, the carbon capture and, and storage and so on. And that, that requires a certain amount of industrial determination. So, so, so it, it's, it's, it's kind of a broader perspective, because as soon as you start talking about hydrogen, you start talking about the gas network uh, and all of those things. Yeah. And so whether you talk about planning or whether you talk about framework, you know, it, it, it's a question of detail. But, but it's a step change beyond, beyond this. Yeah. Jim, I think you had a question. It's a slippery one. It's a very slippery. I mean, the, the you know, the, the 
the, the simple analysis um, uh, is that if you are holding a capacity, pay, capacity um, award, you are saying you'll be available uh, at four hours notice if the system operator uh, thinks the situation is tight. And if you're not, you'll pay a penalty. In practice, those penalties have not been particularly high. And there's a lot of debate around setting the penalty. Um, where you set high penalties, you find that because the capacity market is voluntary, come, some, some participants don't want to go in and take a capacity payment because the risk of paying the penalty is too much. Uh, and then so in the, there was a lot of debate initially about setting the penalty at a level that would not put up the cost of capital too, too much. So the, there, there's that issue around, around the obligation. Um, li illiquid sec secondary trading. So if a, if a company holds a capacity award and they think that they're having problems, they can't get out of it. They can't trade it. And that, and that seems to be a very important ingredient in actually trying to, to uh, improve what's really referred to as non-delivery risk in the sense that uh, an asset is not able, uh, even if it, you know, to, to deliver because it's done something else. Um, in the gas crisis, uh, they, there was a certain amount of socialization of risk um, because uh, um, last year the, the, the prospect of the gas network uh, having inadequate gas within the whole network you know, if, if the, the, the worst European scenarios had gone through, meant that um, all of the, the contracts which were held by by the, the, the gas company, uh, sorry, the, the power companies for for, for supplying electricity um, and also for purchasing gas, under extreme situations, there, there, there could be enormous losses there, and so that there was there was an ad hoc situation where uh, potential um, balancing risks would be socialized across the whole country. But the expectation would obviously be that the gas fire generators will try to trade out as much as possible, um, but um, yeah, there was some ad hoc. Things there. It's, it's tricky, it's really tricky. I mean. You will join me to thank Warmi or all the speakers today. Thank you very much, Professor Byrne, for, for this enlightening discussion, insightful discussion that raises many important issues. For those who, uh, who, who fear that we may run out of time, don't worry, we will use the lunch break as a buffer, so it has been planned for that. So we'll simply delay by 15 minutes the rest of the program. So we will have a, a coffee break. Yeah.